Okay, well, um, good, um, good afternoon. Welcome to Chatham House um, for an event that we are entitling uh, Political Change and the G20 Presidency for Argentina. Uh, I'm very, um, very happy to welcome here today uh, Marcus Peña, who is the Chief of Staff of President Mauricio Macri. Uh, one of the key members of uh, President Macri's team. Uh, and in a, a minute, uh, Marcus is going to outline his vision of Argentina. Um, we're then going to take questions. I'm going to ask some questions first. Uh, then we're going to take questions uh, from the audience. And we're going to try and wrap this up by 2 o'clock. So let me first um, go through one or two small housekeeping matters. Um, first, um, this is a on-the-record meeting, unusually, um, for just a mouse. Um, it's being recorded and live-streamed. Um, you can tweet uh, comments if you'd like to. Uh, but that does mean you'll need to leave your phones on. So we'd ask you to turn your phones to silent mode. Um, so I think, that, I think that's it at the moment uh, in terms of those details. So if I can ask Marcus now to um, talk to us for, I think we're expecting about 15, 20 minutes, Marcus, and then we'll ask some more questions. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Richard, for the presentation. It's really an honor to be here in Chatham House. Very happy to be able to give this presentation in the middle of a very political trip for us, a trip where we are sending a clear message of our intention to work together with the United Kingdom in a stronger bilateral relationships in the, in the framework of an intern, intelligent global insertion that we are leading in our country for the past two and a half years. But first I want to give a little bit of a, tell you the story of our change, tell you a story of our government and our country at this moment, tell you a little bit about how we ended up in the presidency of the G20 and how we think we can contribute from that role in this moment of global affairs. And then we can go to the conversation and the questions, which is, I think, always the richest moment. We say that for us, what happened in Argentina is the story of change that was born in a rebellion of Argentines against decades of failures, decades of division, decades of frustration of a country that never in the past decades was able to live up <clears throat> to expectancies, live up to possibilities that it had inside. First of all, because of the capabilities, capabilities of our people, but also because we lacked the organization, the institutions, and the stability for us to grow and to long, look at a long-term process of development. In the year 2015, after a traumatic, in our view, and for many Argentines, populist experience, and against all odds, People elected us, elected President Macri, to lead that change and to lead that way towards the future based on the idea that we needed to build institutions, build a solid and real democracy where not only the freedoms would be guaranteed but also independent justice, political dialogue, a strong Congress, free press, the idea that institutions were there to protect citizens and not a mere instrument of concentration of power of that who obtained the power. The idea of building a pluralistic, open society that didn't intend to impose or have a revenge against the past government, but that would be able to look forward towards the potentialities of the road we could walk together with. The idea also of building a strong economy that would reduce in time its dependence of external finance that could 
show a path, not of short-term growth, but of 20 years of growth, maybe not so dramatically as in other moments with high rates of growth and then high recessions, but a constant, moderate, but permanent growth based more in investment, based more in, in integrating to global economy, based on the capabilities of uh, leaders in entrepreneurs or businessmen or exchange with the world that could drive a more competitive economy. The idea also that we could do those transformations and that change taking care of the more vulnerable parts of our society. We reached power with 32% of poverty in our country. And the main criteria, the main objective our president has put publicly to the society by which he wants to be evaluated is how much we were able to lead the path to reduction of poverty and to transform our education system, our health system, our taking care of the more vulnerable parts of our country, the social and competitive infrastructure also that was needed. That change that also had to tackle the fight against drug trafficking that had grown a lot in our country, but also that had to have an intelligent global insertion, as we said before. We think that Argentina has only a future possible if it integrates to the world economy, if it plays a protagonic role in this time that we live in, and that can combine believing in values, believing in multilateralism, believing in peace, believing in dialogue, believing in integration, believing in rejecting terrorism, drug trafficking, and all the, the complicated things that obviously come also with the globalization. But also the possibility of being pragmatic in terms of having good relationships with every country, opening up intelligently to being able to trade and to generate investment, tourism, and cooperation, first with the countries of our region, but also with all the main countries of the world, and also with different economies of the world. We have been able, in that sense, to open markets for, in a difficult moment, understanding that at this time, when we arrived with this idea, a lot of countries were debating going the other way around. But we are confident and understand and believe that each country has its own perspective, its own history, and its own starting point. And our starting point is one of the closed, most closed economies in the world. We think also that global insertion will permit us to bring more solid structure to our reforms. That's why from the first day we work to enter OECD, a process that is advanced, um, and hopefully this year will be completed. But we are working in the reforms of OECD as we were already members, especially in transparency, anti-corruption, public statistics, and all that can help build more confidence in our system. We led the idea of being candidates for G20. We were also, and I want to talk about that now, we also worked for being hosts for the WTO meeting in December, when a lot of people said, now be host of WTO meeting, it doesn't sound a good moment. And we said, yes, it's a good moment. Because in all of those roles, we believe we can play a role as an honest broker, as a country that has good relationships with everybody. And as our G20 claim says, we can send a message of the importance of building consensus for a fair and sustainable development. It's the first G20 that's hosted in South America. And we believe that that makes us um, committed to make a different perspective from G20s led in other parts of the world because we have different realities, we have different situations, but we also have a lot of positive energy to incorporate at this moment where a lot of anxiety and doubt comes with the volatility of the change in the global scenario. We think that the three main points of agenda where we have been working for the past six months in that sense are priorities that are priorities for that fair and sustainable development we are talking about. One, the development of infrastructure, especially the financing for infrastructure, something that our countries need a lot, and also with the climate change debate becomes something that's uh, very actual and, and necessary, very urgent. The debate about jobs and education in this 21st century, we believe that's another 
very important debate because if we don't debate about education, about jobs, it probably we're not debating about the things that most people in the world today are afraid about. Uh, they fear about all the technology changes and how they will affect their lives. And we think it's very important that global debates be about uh, local problems and real problems. And third, the debate about food and the debate about trade about food and all the organization also affected by climate change, by technological um, changes and the debates in trade. So to summarize, we believe that Argentina today can bring not lessons, not a, a will of teaching the world how to do things as we have done in the past. Sometimes in, we participated in global forums with that idea. But neither that nor being uh, without confidence about what we can show that it's basically two things. Uh, an example of the cost of bad policy, the cost of corruption, of populism, of governments that take power for themselves and not to serve people. And it's not only the past government, it's a lesson we have learned in the past very strongly. And also the importance of hope, the importance of understanding that change is not something that is uh, something you can resign to. It's something that's very important that political leadership understand that peaceful, democratic change is possible. It's possible and necessary. And that all the changes we're facing as a world bring us more opportunities for pushing change. But we have to be very conscious and listen and hear our people to understand how those changes that we're living today adapt to political demands. And now surely we'll talk about the difficulties, the challenges we're facing, but we want to be very clear about the future for Argentina. We are confident that this change has come to stay, that this time is different than in the past, but not because Mauricio Macri is the responsible for that or for the Cambiemos party or for our team, but because this change is led and owned by the people of Argentina. They don't want to go back to any past and they are very mature in confronting the challenges we are living after many years of failure and deception. So again, thank you again for this invitation. For us, it's very important to be able to transmit this message and to answer the questions and dialogue and to show that this road of change in Argentina is going steady ahead. Thank you very much. So, um, Marcos, when I, when I was in Buenos Aires in January, um, everything seemed very calm indeed. I mean, uh, you were very optimistic. I came away with a very optimistic impression. Um, clearly, there were challenges out there. And then all of a sudden, um, a couple of months ago, we, we were into this period of financial turbulence mm -hmm. with the peso falling like a stone, local investors in particular taking funds out of uh, peso, some looking for dollars. How much of a surprise was that sudden bout of financial instability for you? Well, first I think that um, we always were very conscious that until we reach our fiscal balance and a more uh, re reduced dependence on external finance, we would be vulnerable to changes in global scenarios and changes, uh, local changes that could affect confidence so conscious we were of those risks that in the first days of January we went to the market and obtained most of the financing we needed for this year at great rates and a great timing we think and so conscious we are of that vulnerability that we led a very um, important decision to go preventively to the IMF because we know that that vulnerability exists and we know that the combination of external factors and internal factors reduced one level the confidence there was in, in our country. We always understood that we were going through a narrow path, a path where on one side we had confidence of our citizens on the future and on the hope of the road we're going through, 
and the other side, the confidence of the markets. And the idea of not so much a confidence if, uh, or not only if our government was going to be able to lead these policies, but also how much the country had changed, really. And at times where there's more volatility and a, and a more complex emerging markets uh, situation, as several people told us in the past weeks, you are not only defending or discussing your government, but your past 70 years. Um, but again, we think and we said that during the, the, the currency crisis that we had the tools and we had the lessons learned to prevent that from transforming to a structural crisis. And we are confident in that sense. So you've been obliged to um, go to the International Monetary Fund, mm -hmm. which must, you must have been reluctant to do given the symbolism of that in Argentina. You, be, you are obliged, I think, to make an additional fiscal adjustment. You've interest rates at 40%. That mix of policies looks to be hard to reconcile with continuing optimism on the growth front. How do you balance all those competing demands? I mean, can you give us an idea maybe, first of all, pick that apart a bit, give us an idea, first of all, about the scale of the fiscal adjustment that the government is going to have to make now over and above what it might have had, to, what it was planning to do anyway. Is, the, is the gradualism at risk in that sense? Well, first, I, I think it's important to understand what gradualism is. No? Gradualism is the path we have between the idea of correcting uh, or adjusting our economy in, from one day to the other, some, as some people think is necessary, or the idea of not doing anything and uh, ending up in a structural crisis or Venezuela's path. In the middle, there's not uh, a hard science. No? It's, a, it's a combination of things where what we have done is to go in the path of fiscal balance, protecting growth, and protecting um, the most vulnerable parts of our society. Um, and we believe that that structure is maintaining. This step that we have lowered in terms of confidence what is uh, going to have to do as a government, what we have to do is go faster in that, in that convergence. And I think in, when the agreement with the IMF is closed, we'll see there a roadmap in terms of uh, the speed uh, and in terms of uh, the restrictions we'll have, especially for the 2019 budget. What we are very clear about is that this agreement is something that we take full responsibility for. Uh, the policy is defined by Argentina, uh, and the rhythm about the, or the restrictions we'll have, um, in any case, if it wasn't with the IMF, it would be with the markets in terms of uh, adapting to a new scenario or reality of global markets and of the situation of Argentina. Um, and we are working to find an agreement and our economic program that can preserve growth for next year. We think that that's very important for the basis of this program, uh, and, and, um, and we think it's very possible. So when you see it, what you have to do in terms of um, accelerating that fiscal balance path, um, it's important to see what we already have done. Uh, by the end of this year, we, have, we, would have, we will have reduced uh, public expenditure on GDP from 42% to 38%. And plus that, two points less of taxes. Um, and we did that with growth. And there's not too many um, examples in the past of that accomplishment. And basically, we believe it's a combination of factors. It's not one factor that reduces everything, but it's a combination of things about what the government, the national government does and how it does it, what the provincial governments do and how they do it, and how the, the cities um, work and what they do. Um, we have also voted in December a very important fiscal responsibility law that gives uh, um, a framework to work with the provinces that's very important, a tax reform. Um, so we think it's, it's perfectly compatible, the idea of this new path we have to walk through with the idea of growing and keeping up the hope of the future of the country. So just to go, just to 
look at that again, 42% when you came into office, yes. public spending in Argentina, 42% of GDP. By the end of this year, it'll be down to 38%. Yes. If that's presuming that you make the 2.5% primary uh, deficit target yeah, for this yeah. year. We're pretty sure we're going to be... And you're, going to, you're sure yes. you're going to do that? Yes, yes. And is that... Does that take into account any additional savings uh, cuts you'll make as a result of the, the fund's agreement with the fund? Well, we, we prefer to wait for the fund agreement to be signed and then we'll be able to offer a very clear roadmap in the future. But we have been very respectful of the, the negotiations and the conversations, so we I think it's better to, to show it all together. How <coughs> politically difficult will it be to execute some of these fiscal measures? I mean, last week, quite markedly, you, you lost a vote in the Congress, and this alliance between your own party and alliance and the... Um, the, the Justicialist Peronist Party looked to be a bit fragile. You know, several Peronist uh, senators voted against the government. I mean, what are you doing to try to rebuild, stitch back that, that alliance back together? Well, something that's important of political context, maybe for those that are not so acquainted with Argentine politics, we're the first government in a century to govern with minority in both houses. Um, and all that we have been accomplishing has been through dialogue, through consensus, and passing very important laws. And I think that's something that's sometimes understated, but I think it's very important. The same day the House of Representatives voted this tariff law that we vetoed, they voted a new capital markets law and a new antitrust law. Then in terms of institutional building, were much more important than the debate, uh, we believe, about the tariffs that they knew at the end of the game that we would veto. The same day the Senate voted the same law, they voted the, um, the executive decree transformed to law uh, of debureaucratization of the Argentine economy, modifying 170 laws that were basically obstaculizing uh, investment and job creation. So it's a, it's a country of contradictions in a way. I think it's a good news we, nobody has majority because we're all forced to sit down and, and get together. And, and in one point, this agreement with IMF, I think will put white over black, or black over white, <laughs> uh, in terms of understanding our restrictions. And what we want to debate and what we are, are talking with the, with the opposition, because we don't have an alliance, they are opposition, and we respect their role as opposition, but we have very good possibilities of working together in a lot of things, is we have to debate our priorities we have a great opportunity to understand how to, we can um, organize better as a country to do what we have to do in each level. Uh, and in that sense, as always, we're optimistic. We believe that uh, um, the, consens the necessary consensus are possible and will be reflected in a budget for 2019. That doesn't mean that there will be conflicts or debates or manifestations, or, but I think and that's a, a broader uh, concept that any democracy today understands that the political reality is complex, it's difficult, it's, uh, uh, it's challenging. Does it change the electoral outlook for 2019? Well, I think that those that thought that a couple of months ago that 2019 election almost even wasn't going to exist, they were going to give us by decree for more years, or those that think now that it's going to be very difficult to win it, uh, are exaggerating a bit in both ends. We never underestimate an election, less in the 21st century, less in Argentina. Uh, we strongly believe that there are fundamentals that lead us to think that the majority of the population want to continue changing. And we have a lot of information in that sense that the majority of the population never wants to go back to where we were. Um, said that, we're going to have to take it as an election, as we have done all the elections since we started, uh, uh, since we started doing politics 17 years ago. As an election where we start with zero votes and where we're going to work like we are already working with our Cambiemos organization in every part of the country, going door by door. The president, to all his team, we go door by door. Um, we talk to people, we listen, and we understand that they are the bosses, not, not us. 
So I think that any politician that today relaxes and says, oh, I already have this amount of votes and everything is easy, uh, I think probably will have a bad surprise in the future. I've got some other questions, but I think I'm going to open up the, uh, the, the meeting to, to, to questions from the floor uh, at this point. Um, there are some microphones that are coming around. So, Christina, perhaps we'll um, first question down here. Thank you. Christina Cortes from Canning House. Um, I wanted to go back to G20 yep. for a moment and ask about Argentina's role within that context. Um, just thinking in terms of what you've been saying about uh, Argentina promoting free trade and going very much along that path, you yourself said just now that a lot of countries um, are debating going in the other direction. Um, so I'm wondering what influence or what, what influence you feel you can bring to bear to try and take the whole group still in the free trade direction and particularly also interested in how you see the bilateral work between the UK and Argentina working to support that agenda. Okay. I think um, it's very important to, to clarify that the role of G20 is not a role of uh, we weren't elected to, to lead the world, but we were elected to, to lead the conversations during one year of the group of countries and all the, the support groups, uh, the, the interest groups that participate in G20. And that's why we, we emphasize so much on the idea of honest brokers, because the WTO meeting in December showed that it's almost as important today as how we debate things as what are the results of those debates. And first, the idea of debating in search of consensus, not in search of conflict, search of uh, debating, understanding that everybody plays a role and has a legitimacy in their positions because they defend their uh, natural interest and their perspective, and that each perspective is different and respectable in that sense. Um, the idea that uh, we believe that when you see what has happened in the past months in the G20 meetings, um, is that probably when you go to the concrete things, in many things the world has agreed. Uh, and probably the, the narrowness of the debate today is much stronger than uh, 50 years ago or 60 years ago. The, the problem is that sometimes the public debate stresses more on the differences and the symbolism than in the concrete things. So when you do an exercise, and we do, we believe that, again, because before eight years, uh, the eight years in city government, we also govern in minority. So we we're very used to governing minority. Is to how to build those, those dynamics where you start first on putting, um, celebrating the, the common ground, and then trying to find a road for that um, separate ground, or for that conflict. And every country, in the G20 has participated in almost every meeting in the G20. So in, in a way, that's a message that everybody is giving in, about the role of multilateralism, the role of uh, these institutions, these debates. The same thing happened with WTO. Um, and I think it's also maybe a contribution we can do to say uh, you can defend a perspective without offending anybody. Uh, we have excellent relations with the current uh, U.S. administration, as we had excellent relations with the past government of the United States. Uh, we don't, uh, we can't, we shouldn't uh, be the ones that mold domestic or international policy of another country. We have to be respectful of our perspective and respectful of the mechanism to find common ground. And so in that sense with, with Britain, we think, uh, we have talked yesterday with, with several of the secretaries, we are really happy at the um, the level of, uh, of common ground and enthusiasm we find in working together in, in, in one part of the agenda that I think that is today is a pretty much a big consensus. For example, the fight against terrorism, the fight against drug trafficking, of uh, illegal financing of uh, corruption or different uh, actives, the need to work in international cooperation or development, the idea of promoting investment, um, but also in, in the common ground uh, of our two countries that understanding that we have a conflict that we have to resolve, but we can still work together in a whole range of agenda. Um, um, and, and, and again, give an example in that sense that conflicts shouldn't paralyze dialogue. More questions from the 
floor. All right, shut that. Yes, Maximiliano Mendez Parra from the Overseas Development Institute. Uh, Argentina has shown, I mean, has exercised some regional leadership, specifically in the last years, in the negotiation with the EU in its free trade agreement. That uh, uh, negotiation window is sort of closing for issues in, in the region, particularly the elections in Brazil, but also issues in the EU. And, and the negotiation with the EU plays a key role in the sort of the openness strategy of Argentina, but also in terms of building institutionality and also in, in locking reforms. What is the sort of alternative uh, that Argentina has in case that actually you don't agree on time? And eventually, if you agree, what's next? Uh, well, uh, it, it, it's related to what we talked before about uh, an, an inter intelligence insurgent policy to the world. That is meaning talk to everybody and go as further as you can with everybody <laughs> in terms of in some cases we open markets from some products in some cases we can talk about um, some uh, specific agreements in some cases we can open trade negotiations in some cases we can talk about strategic alliances um, the first thing we think is that we have to take ego out of the, that idea uh, many times the idea is don't try to negotiate if you don't know you're going to be successful because it's going to look like a failure. We don't think that. We think it's already good for us the, in the minimal range to be negotiating, to be thinking about it, to be debating about it because obviously you don't manage all the variables. Some of the variables don't depend on you because you have partners, because you have realities in other countries. Most of the Western leaders that were in office when we arrived are, have changed. Uh, and that's a challenge because you build relations, now you have to build relations with others. Um, but said that, we are st still confident that we can uh, seize this window of the UE Mercosur agreement. We think we have advanced in tough, uh, tough negotiation and aspects, and we think we still are in condition to to close the deal and President Macri is putting all his relationships, his capital and his will to try to, to obtain that. Uh, meanwhile, we are negotiating or opening negotiations with uh, Japan and Korea, for example, as, as Mercosur. We have been talking with, um, with the Pacific Alliance or with Chile in terms of what things we can do in terms of complementary agreements to advance more. Um, we are working, as I said, with African countries, Asian countries, um, Latin American countries, with, with North America where we advanced, for example, in the United States with the SGP modification where we re-entered and that, that permits us to, to advance. Understanding at the same time that we have to prepare our private sector for those opportunities because we have been, during too much time, um, used to the idea of a closed economy, a non-competitive economy, and a defensive economy. and. So that's a transformation that sometimes in the day by day seems a lot of time, but for those economic decisions, two and a half years is a very short time. No? And so um, that would be, I think, the, the, the first basis. And obviously when the elections in Brazil occur and we have a new government in Brazil, that will be also a possibility to, to deepen the relationship between each other. <coughs> Hi, Jimena Blanco from Veresk Maplecroft. Um, you were just touching upon very briefly on the change in government in Brazil. There's lots of elections in Latin America. I wanted to know a bit more what do you think are the risks and the opportunities for Argentina's role in the region more broadly going forward, not just under this administration, but as a country and a state policy? Well, I think that the important first answer is how we vision our role in the region. No? And, and we don't believe too much, and we always were very clear in that sense, in the idea of an objective of leading the region as an objective in itself. What we believe in is the possibility, a little bit more humbly, is at least to offer an example to other countries of how we can go through a democratic and peaceful uh, development road and an institution building road. Uh, we think that's a contribution. And that's also a contribution that we can make and we have made to be very clear about our stance on, on values as in human rights or in democracy in the Venezuelan case. And the possibility of working 
in dialogue with the countries of the region, especially with the Lima Group, in uh, generating a common policy in that sense, um, in understanding the restrictions that the regional system or the global system has in front of a dictatorship in this case. Um, I, I think, again, as I said before, politics in this time we live in uh, is probably going to change and continue changing every time more because society has changed more than its institutions. So there's a tension there that still hasn't been, sometimes that we believe, recognized and much less uh, addressed in terms of the importance of representation when you have democratic institutions that were designed for other types of societies 100 and 200 years ago. So that, that stress or that challenge um, makes a, a, a big challenge for, for all the political systems, particularly in our region where we're not used to uh, decades and decades of stability in democracy. So, uh, but when you see the results of several elections that already have been, we think that there have been peaceful elections, free elections that renovate the institutional strength. So that's also good news. Um, JP Raymond from uh, Al Jazeera. Uh, you said that Argentina defines the policies in terms of the agreement with the IMF. Um, I don't know if I understood that correctly. No. Okay, I thought, okay. No, no, no. Well, what I say is we define our policies in terms of our full sovereignty and we don't believe that IMF was going to define our policy. No. But in I mean, the IMF has changed, but it hasn't changed that much. There will be some demands that, um, you know, they might not, um, agree with Argentina and as much as they like the government. Are you prepared to pay the social and political cost? Well, the first thing that we believe is that when you go to ask for a loan, uh, you, you're the responsible for asking for a loan. So what you have to do is do everything you can, and that's what we're doing, to reduce exposition to getting loans. And first, um, if you want um, to to have more strength or less dependence, it's good that you manage your affairs in a way that you have more sustainability and strength. Second, we don't believe that, um, that the conversation with the IMF or the same with the private markets um, are showing uh, an incompletion or, 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 or um, a hostile uh, stands against the Argentine people. I think the, everybody is understanding this path of change and the need to do sustainable things in our economy, in our, in our um, social structure, in our political system, and they have been expressing themselves in that way. So we are very thankful for the, con for the support we're receiving from all the major economies of the world in terms of uh, this program we're doing and this uh, huge challenge of normalizing a country after too many years of, of destruction of institutions, corruption, and um, the result in poverty. So we are very confident in that sense that we are going to maintain uh, an, a policy that takes care of the most needy in our society, that takes care of the more vulnerable parts of our society, that puts a priority on growth and the idea of better uh, well-being for the people, and that also fights against those things that the past government uh, wasn't able to do or didn't want to do. That's, for example, the, the problem of drug trafficking in our country. Um, so we think that when you have a, a government that is decent, that is transparent, and that is serving its people, trying to do the best thing they can do, the results are always better than when you have the contrary. Hi, it's uh, Karen Stroger from Reuters. I was just wondering, on the IMF program, could you give me a few more details? When uh, yesterday the IMF said uh, good progress is being made, are you expecting to reach a deal in the next weeks, within uh, June, or when, when can we expect that? I What's the size going to be, and, and what conditions? I'd love Thanks. to answer that question, <laughs> but you know I can't. So I won't give you more details. I just 
use the words of the IMF that we're doing good progress. And as soon as we have the agreement, it will be communicated with all the details. Can you give me a sense of what you think your currency is at the moment? Do you think it's a stable place? We think we have a floating uh, currency system and a bank, a central bank that is in full capabilities of defining the monetary policy and, and, the, um, and in general, the possibility of the stability and growth of the country. Thank you very much, uh, Marcos, for your kind words. Uh, uh, this is David Franco from Banco Santander. Uh, obviously, all these countries in Latin America will be experiencing quite a lot of tension in terms of the financing needs, uh, given that the Fed and the ECB eventually will normalize rates. And that we're still struggling with low productivity and, and lower growth as opposed to the previous years. Um, Mexico is a country that has put in place reforms, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it's back to the theme of implementation. So if you can walk us through the most important reform that Argentina needs in order to reduce these vulnerabilities, and what do you see are the main challenges with the political landscape that you're facing us? Uh, there was a lot of comments in terms of the elections in more than one year, so that would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I would say two different parts. Uh, one part is our macroeconomic policy and the need for reducing our vulnerability. I think the, the IMF agreement tackles part of that question and gives more certainty for the next couple of years in terms of um, our reducing our vulnerability to, to the volatility of the market. Um, and also because it, I think the idea we agree on is to, it will put a piece of paper with a more clear idea of the, of the, um, uh, of the full economic scenario and the monetary policy, the fiscal policy, and the expectancy of all the, all the consistency of those policies. No? Um, I think that's, that's one part, and that helps um, to have the, the umbrella in case the, the storms continue and, and, and get deeper. And I think, again, w with time, um, our, our decision to go to the IMF will be seen as a very important preventive measure uh, for a more complex global context. When you think about the program of government, um, we have had an approach of it's so much we have to do <laughs> that we have had an approach of uh, a very broad agenda. When you, you can find it in the web, that's there our program of government uh, and over a hundred objectives that we are advancing in simultaneous order. Understanding that the most important part of all is, not, is to maintain the rhythm and to advance and mm, to try to avoid being stuck in one point in, in, in a winner-take-all debate about one, one aspect. The most crucial laws in terms of normalizing our economy were already passed. What we need now is the new budget for next year, but we have time for that debate. But all other policy uh, might have some laws that could accelerate things, but are not crucial in terms of uh, the sustainability of the program and in terms of these reforms, which I would say in three big tracks. One track of how to make our economy more competitive, um, and we are doing a lot in terms of a method methodology there of productivity uh, tables and debates where unions uh, private sector and government participate in a very concrete, pragmatic agenda to try to avoid the big uh, ideological debates and go to automotive sector, to um, poultry sector, or, or uh, to the sector of um, uh, steel or, or any other sector in the economy. And it's very interesting, the President leads most of those meetings uh, with a very big table, open agenda, and everybody of the government that participates in it and in those matters is in the table, provincial governments when it's something related to provinces, unions and private sector. And it's really a very interesting mythology because things move and things go in a very good way. And that is complemented with more structural policies, obviously, in terms of uh, our infrastructure plan. We are doing a very ambitious infrastructure plan that um, will continue next year, especially with 
more impulse on the PVP that we have uh, implemented this year. And the good things about implementing very late things is that you can learn from all the lessons from other countries, so we are doing that. Um, and that's going to continue, and that's very important as a factor of competitivity. The idea of um, working with unions in terms of getting better uh, capacitation and working with the education system in that sense is something that's also for us more important than the idea of a labor reform. Again, big titles that afterwards <coughs> explain sometimes um, little and, and that today are, are theoretical. We think it's more uh, of the movement of the, of the changes than one stop and go change. Um, obviously working in debureaucratization and, and helping and facilitate investment and facilitating um, entrepreneurs and the possibility of, of company creating. Today you can create um, a company in 24 hours online. And two years ago you had to do 70 some uh, days of, of work and, and maybe you could obtain the company. Um, opening markets as I said before well, and we can continue but that, that's one idea where the biggest challenge is for the society in our public debate is the idea of understanding something that for the rest of the world is pretty obvious, but that it's the private sector that's going to create the jobs in, in, the, in our future, not the public sector uh, as in, in sometimes in our past. In, in the last years of the past government, one out of four jobs that was created was private sector. Now three out of four jobs is private sector. So that has already changed and it's working very well. Um, another combo uh, that's very important is institutional reform and the importance of, again, not doing uh, a reform process based on the confidence that one person can bring, but really change institutions from public statistics, justice reform, the importance of, as we said before, drug trafficking or fight against terrorism, the possibility of working um, in, in permanent uh, openness, uh, freedom of information, um, uh, liberty of press, well, all, all that comes with institution building. And, and third, the social policy, the importance of three out of four out of uh, pesos of the public budget goes to social investment. Um, it's the largest proportion in our history and that's basically the objective of strengthening our safety net for the more vulnerable sectors while we destroy the culture of uh, clientelism and corruption and beside that and work on liberating their capabilities, strengthening their capacities and integrating them to the economic system. Uh, again, some of the processes are going to be more long term, some are going to be more short term, but uh, the combination of all is the importance of rhythm and rhythm and not stopping and stopping and even again, as I said, in the days that we were more complicated with some things, some reform passed or some new uh, infrastructure project was inaugurated or something, some new market was opened. So we, we designed the system so we, it never stops. Thank you. This is Francisco Ambrosi from Veracity Worldwide. There have been some protests in the country in the last week regarding the tariff veto by President Macri. Um, how do you think the, the government should um, kind of recompose this, the, the, pro, the situation with the opposition and how this will affect uh, investments in energy, especially in Mendoza and Neuquén with Paca Muerta? Well, first, that um, Argentina, uh, for uh, all of you that you, you know in Buenos Aires maybe, you will see that we are one of the few cities in the world where in the morning news you have the weather and you have the map of different uh, road uh, protests. <laughs> um, it's part of our culture. We are a contestatory <coughs> country, uh, so we don't get too altered about that uh, in, in the sense that it, we feel that it's absolutely impossible in probably any democracy, but especially in a Argentina democracy to think that everybody's going to agree in everything and that there won't be protest. Given that context, you also have to understand that the ex-president Cristina Kirchner and her followers never acknowledged even the defeat in the election you know, when she was the first president not to trespass the attributes of power to another president. So from the first day, 
the same people mostly change the subject, but they always try to find an excuse to show popular discontent. But in no way we think that that reflects reality in the streets today, where obviously you can find people who can be more angry or more anguished or fearful or disappointed or happy or anything. But that doesn't traduce in a, in a social unrest or the idea of a country that will be paralyzed by protest. We don't think so. Uh, again, there's probably, uh, each country has its, its own way of processing these differences. We have a, pro a process that could imply that maybe we'll have um, some strike or we have some manifestation or we have some protest but in no way we think it compromises the the peace in our society the conviction of change of the majority of society and the stability for investment or for the future and that's why also we are very confident very confident uh, as we were in 2014 when very few people believed in our confidence in that matter that next year change will win the election um, change in this in the deeper sense also let's change Cambiemos as, as a name of a coalition because we are confident that the majority of society uh, is convinced that even when it's very difficult, we have to move forward. Uh, Laurie Elston G from the FCA. I was just wondering, as you build towards the G20 summit, what is worrying you most? Well, um, I think for us the, the main objective is to be able to maintain the, the spirit of dialogue and of participation as an honest broker that wants to push an agenda, but especially wants the, the, the success of, of, the, of the institution in a way. No? Uh, when we enter the WTO meeting, one of our worries obviously is all the scenarios could be on the table was that it could be the last WTO meeting in Buenos Aires. We don't want it to be in history, the last meeting. And, and it was a pretty better meeting than many people expected. Um, so we hope that, again, not thinking of one meeting, the summit at the end of the process, but of all the hundreds of meetings and dozens of meetings of different groups, um, that we can end this year having made a contribution in terms of uh, a way of approaching the debate and, and the problems of the world. Oh, thank you. Hi, Lucia Camagna from NK International. A bit in line with the what worries you most and going back to domestic politics and how the economic team has played before the previous four weeks and after, and the changes we've seen in your team and your place as the person coordinating all those ministers, what worries you most? Well, first, that uh, sometimes we say if we have to isolate one factor, one factor to explain our history of failures as a country, we would resume it as culture of power, how, how we have thought about power in our country because there's no other structural reason to fail but our incapacity to think power in terms of public service, in terms of transparency, in terms of teamwork, in terms of confidence on the other, in terms of um, honest dissent and, and tolerating pluralism as, as something that enriches, in, enriches us. We have a caudillista tradition in our country. We have the tradition of thinking that we will have a savior that will resolve the problems, which is sometimes a pathology when you think that it never worked in the past. So uh, if it never worked, uh, we understand it in, in a moment of fear, you, you recur to what you know. So, but you have to be calm and think, well, what you know has taken you nowhere <laughs> because it never succeeded that way. In that context, the whole debate about how we govern, how we organize our team, if we have too many ministers or, or few ministers, if we have all, all the novel around the relationships, I think are hugely overestimated, hugely overestimated in a team that, as I see, uh, day by day, led by our president, uh, works as a team. Works as a team that 
may have differences sometimes, but has no difference. And, and, I, and I mean a team, not only the ministers of the government, but Cambiemos as a coalition. We have a unity in values of what we want for the country and how we think we can obtain that. That doesn't mean that we can have differences on implementation, on rhythm, on styles, on different things, but that's the structural thing that puts us together. And that's why sometimes it's disappointing because we are used to also to the massacres inside governments, not only in Argentina, I think it's something that's very common, uh, finding the narrative to the secret plots of who's fighting who behind the scenes. But believe us, at this time it's not like that. It's not like that. Uh, what we do believe, and we think it's a lesson learned from this um, situation, is that we have to be very careful about any signal that could commit or compromise the idea of independence of central bank. So we are all agreeing on that. Um, we think that also the fiscal challenge will require um, a more strong coordination of who is negotiating with the IMF at the same time, that is our minister um, Duhovne. And, and also in that situation, I think, uh, again, I don't blame others for that. It's part of our responsibility to be very clear on how we govern because it's very important um, for, for everybody abroad and for everybody in the country. Um, that's part of the transparency. That the, the role I play as chief of cabinet is something that was in our constitution since 94, but as many things that are in our constitution and our laws was never used as such. So uh, if you see what we are doing as part of the Jefatura Gabinete is doing what the president is asking us, that is doing what the design of this, that institution was originally. That is a, a, a coordinator in terms of um, a, a level between the ministers and the president and they can work on the coherence of the full government. But there's no intention of, of replacing the ministers in that sense but to occupy my role in that sense and, and we think that, again, as a general balance also, uh, the road we are working is an uncharted road. Nobody ever tried this combination of things that we are doing at this moment in the conditions we are doing it after the type of government we did. And so we are learning sometimes in the path, trying to find how to correct, how to do things better, how to find the right balance between all the factors and all the challenges. And we don't, we're not afraid of saying that. Again, we are a museum of egomaniacs that, uh, <laughs> that have said to the world that they were the saviors of the humanity and, and failed one by one. We're trying to be humans, we're trying to be <laughs> civil servants that are trying to lead this desire of change. Marcus, thank you very much. A great point to end on, uh, dismissing the museum of egomaniacs. Um, um, we, uh, I'd like, I'm sure we've got many more questions. Um, let me just say that on the 25th of October, Nicholas Duhovne, who, who Marcus mentioned just now, the Minister of Finance, will be one of a number of speakers at a, a full day event on Latin America at Chatham House. That's Thursday, the 25th of October. Um, in the meantime, um, if you could keep your seats while Marcus uh, and the team get out, because I think you've got a you've got a busy agenda this afternoon and off to New York Ten tonight. Down the street, um, go, yeah. But I'd like to thank you very much for what's been a very interesting um, uh, meeting. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard. Thank you very much.